welcome to the Industry Angel Podcast. We hear from the best business minds across the globe, entrepreneurs, social influencers, marketing mavens, and sales rock stars. We've got them all. Here comes your weekly dose of inspiration with your host, Ian Farah. Welcome to episode 72 of the Industry Angel, fresh from the live episode, which I hope you enjoyed. We had a lot of fun, a little bit stressful. <laughs> I'm just laughing here, a lot of techie stuff going on. Facebook Live, Live Through Periscope. The the audience enjoyed it as well. Thanks to Jen and Gren for hosting us and to Martel for the kind sponsorship. Thanks also to Gavin Forster for his world-class photography skills. And from Startup Stickers, Rick printed us some stickers out to give away. So we had a great night. We'll be doing it again. So why not join our mailing list and you can keep up the date with our events and competitions and that kind of thing. Today's sponsor is a software company called Pro Forecast. I've been working with these guys and they've got an incredibly comprehensive and user-friendly financial forecasting application. So this cloud-based system lets you move beyond Excel spreadsheets and streamlines your business planning your budgeting and your cash flow forecasting. So check out proforecast.com. Right, let's hear from today's guest. Today we have the founder and CEO of Selling to Zebras, the software company that helps organizations find, close, expand, and retain their top revenue producing customers. Welcome to the industry angel, Jeff Koza. Hey, thank you, Ian. I'm excited to be here. Hey, how was that for an introduction? That was terrific. Now, do you only sell to zebras or do you sell it to zebras? Uh, we only sell to zebras and we do call them zebras sometimes also. Uh, oh. Yeah, that, that, the, the, the zebra was born actually in the Netherlands, which was, was, was uh, where the business was headquartered that um, I was part of when we actually coined the term and when we created the first zebra. And they called it zebra always. <laughs> Did they? They did. Yeah. Oh, Jim, I've got a bit of a problem with zebras because my local football team, Sunderland, play in red and white, okay? And our rivals play in black and white. Interesting. So, but do, <laughs> so, do, you, do you know how much red there actually is in a zebra's stripes? Maybe you don't. I don't. Please tell well, me. Well, there's there's red and there's brown and there's black. You know, you certainly know them as black and white, but they're really not black and white. If you look up close, there's many colors in the zebra stripes. Ah, uh, man, I'm, I'm back in love with zebras. You've, so, you've sold <laughs> Turned you around, you've sold right? <laughs> yeah, so you haven't. Do you know some Newcastle fans won't eat bacon because it's red and white? It's very, it's very, oh, it's, wow. it's hard up here. <laughs> well, and you guys play the real football too. We we have pretend we football do. over here, you know. <laughs> so, Jeff, I'm excited to speak to you today, Jeff, because as a sales professional, I enjoyed reading your book. So you, you kindly sent me that across and uh it's very methodical. There's some great tools to take away. Um, but it was interesting that you, you mentioned the Netherlands, and so this is back in the day. So why didn't you wind us back, and how did this all start? Well, back when I joined a, an, a small ERP company, um, they were headquartered in, in the Netherlands. They were called Bon, B-A-A-N. It was run by the Bon brothers, uh, Jan and Paul Bon. And, uh, and they, they had done a nice job selling to smaller manufacturers, primarily uh, in and around the Netherlands, the Benelux countries. Um, but they had never really done bigger deals and they had um, they didn't have a track record in the U.S. And uh, so and they wanted to expand here. They had a great product. They didn't have a sales team. And um, that that was really the beginning. We, you know, coming out of uh, a launch of, of people here, we actually uh, created what we called the Bond Zebra, which is the perfect customer, and then you measure all your prospects against that perfect customer, and you score them, and you only pursue them, and and that's how you build a business is through that focus. So to answer your original question, uh, yes, we only sell to zebras. <laughs> so actually, this concept was was out of barn. Yeah, it was it was a sales team in there to try and come up with a with a perfect customer. It was. Yeah? And, and it was a bet ah. your business decision because ERP, as you know, runs the entire company's business. So if you make a poor decision there, it, it's 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 going to cripple your business at best and, and it could tank your business at worst. 
Well, I do know, as I spent many years as a software sales guy for an ERP author, so uh, yes, uh, and it's funny, I've been on the kind of wrong side of some implementations as well, where the customer, the client has selected an ERP provider and it's been the wrong one and it can go very bad on it. It can go. It can go very wrong. E- even when you sell it right, it, it's it's a difficult proposition because they they have to they have to dedicate. I mean, you, I I was in ERP for so many years and and have helped many ERP companies since uh, since I left as an executive of of Bond. But you can. We used to say that you could take two identical companies and one would be tremendously successful with your software and and the other one would would have a terrible time. Um, so it's it's a tough thing, no question. It is, and and I think you've got to give it the resource from from the client side. You know, if you've got a great project manager on a project, I think the client has to match it as well and put the time in and make well, it. Well, you work. know what you just mentioned is is actually at the very tail end of our process, which is called force success, which not, it it not only holds you accountable, but it holds the client accountable to do the things they need to do to be successful, which which they sadly often don't do, right? That dead right, dead right. Well, I, I've just, I've just skipped ahead to the end there. So, uh, <laughs> but, but that, that, that was the always thing that was always key in my mind. I used to say to the client, look, remember, you've invested money in this. You need to invest time. You, as well. you do, and 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 what we do is we bring them back to the business case. We say, look, this is this was our intent. These were the problems we were looking to solve, and this was the business value we could create if we did. And, and, and here's what we are doing right and doing well. And here's what we need to improve. And here's what you're doing right and well, but here's what you need to improve. And when you get to that last part about what they need to improve, um, that can be an interesting portion of the conversation. <laughs> so, so thinking about that then, thinking about that kind of those conversations, is this why you, you, you've come up with this selling to Zebra's whole program to, to help people sell and to help people buy better? It, it is. Um, if, in fact, we have uh, we have lofty goals. We, we think the world would be a better place if everyone sold this way and everyone bought this way because the premise is that you only call on companies that have the business problem that you uniquely solve and therefore create more value than other solutions they might purchase. And the contrast is if you're, if you're the buyer, you create a buying experience for that, for that buyer, which is what they want to do. They, they don't want to be sold. They want, they want experience a buying experience. And, and that's what this process does. It's very emotional, isn't it? The, the, the buying experience, it has to be, it has to be win-win and sometimes their heads on the block. If the buy, if they buy the wrong system or they buy the wrong product or service. So it's very pain. You're right. It's very painful. It, it, it can be expensive for the business. If you're the owner, it can be, uh, uh dangerous for your career. If you're right. If, yeah. Even if you're an executive. Yeah, definitely. That, that, as, as I was saying, they heads on the block and sometimes you just have to de-risk the whole thing and kind of put that person at ease and say, it's going to be fine. You know, make this purchase at law be fine. But it's easier saying that, isn't it? It's actually proven it. Is, it. it is. And, and like you said before, they, they have to be committed as well. And, and you have to hold them accountable for that. And, and um, we used to sit down. In fact, this is, this is interesting. So uh, a portion of the story I've never told before. Um, so we brought a guy over from from uh, the UK to be our services manager. And his name was Ian. <laughs> his name was Ian. <laughs> All the best sales guys are called and, Ian. <laughs> and uh, when Ian came over, and he had done many implementations throughout Europe, and uh, he and I were having trouble with a with a large implementation that we had sold, and, and we needed to do a force success meeting. And, and Ian and I sat down, and he was telling me all the things they're doing they were doing wrong. And, and I said, Ian, have you told them this? And he said, well, sort of. I said, well, if you know from your experience they're doing something wrong, you owe it to them to not let them do that wrong. That you're, We're not doing our job if we let them make mistakes that we know are, are going to be detrimental to what they said they wanted to accomplish. You, you have to go toe-to-toe with them, and you you can't leave the room until they're doing the right thing. And And that's that's a that's a tough task to task somebody with. It it is, you know. So we've mentioned there about kind of resourcing things correctly, investing time, having the 
I don't know, but, you know, going toe to toe with people and, and maybe confronting them about sales. So you're selling to zebras. Have you put methodologies and plans in place to cover all these off in a sort of staged process? We have it. And yeah, you have, so we, we lay it all out in our book, but, um, but we've taken it further and simplified it even more. We, we created software that, that, uh, uh, is, um, I, I always say, you know, we, we have a, we sort of have a controversial logo, Ian, we have a CRM and then we put a stamp out sign over the top of that. <laughs> and, and the reason we do that is, is not because we stamp out CRM, nor because we don't believe in it. it it's because salespeople don't like it. It's hard to get them to enter data, as you know. <laughs> And, yep, and why is that? Well, it's because principally it's for management. It's for management to see what you're doing. It's for management to have a forecast. It's for management to feel comfortable that the sales teams are, are, are working hard and working in the right way. And sadly, you know, even though there are tools that help sellers sell, um, that's not what the focus is with CRM. So we've sort of tipped the playing field and said, look, you have to satisfy the seller's need to create a, a buying experience. And if you do that and you create materials for them very simply and easily based on some simple inputs, they'll actually use it. And then as a byproduct, you can gather all the information that you need to forecast, to, 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 to literally be able to predict cash flow reliably. And, and that's what we've done with our software. Not not without failure first, by the way, but but that's what we've done. We've simplified it um, over the years, and and everything that's in the book is in the software. So are we talking now then taking a, a, a client or a prospect through a, a set of milestones? So that, is that trying and then trying to yeah, convert so them? Yeah. So yes and no. Um, and, and the reason I say no, the the answer is really yes, but it but it's not necessarily a linear line, right? Because no deal follows a linear okay. line. Um, no deal follows the way it's written in our book even, right? Um, there's there's always, um, well, th things happen in a complex sale because there's there's uh, many people who participate in in, um, in this is the decision process. Um, there's many steps and stages. And, and um, so, but what we prescribe is that you, you do your homework you first you you have to figure out what your zebra is and and that's um easy to talk about not as easy to do um and then you test it and once you have it you do your homework to find others like it you you do research to find and make sure that these new prospects that you think you should pursue actually have the business problem that you've solved for your existing customers and and then when you approach them, that's the way you approach them. You, you say, look, I think we fit. And, and, and I'm trying to earn the right to, to figure that out by doing a little extra than maybe what you'd expect or, or than others have done as they've tried to penetrate and, and have a sales conversation. But here's the evidence of that. Um, here's my research. Here's what I found. Um, Here's the value I believe that I could create if we solve this. And, and the reason I know that this is true is because I've done this here, here, and here. And here's voice of the customer work that we've done that says, this is, this is uniquely how we've solved this for them. And would you like to participate in a buying experience as opposed to a selling experience? And, and, and that's going to cause them to say, what's the difference, right? And the, and the difference is yeah, they get yeah. to decide if they want to go to that next step which you prescribe, which is you're going to lay out a preliminary business case for them. And, and you know, from the book, we get predictive about that. We say, we think we can create about this much value for you. Here, here it is in economic terms. Is this interesting enough to investigate? And if it's not, that's okay. We'll, we'll go somewhere else. Um, cause that's the buyer's journey. You, you participate. If we're in the wrong place or, or if this isn't a priority that tell us now, because that's good for us. Uh, we'll, you know, maybe it, it, maybe it's just timing. Maybe you have this problem, but it's just timing, whatever it is, but you, you collaboratively agree on that next step. And, it, and it's always a logical step that actually helps them. It helps you too, but it first helps them. It's interesting. I've wrote, I've wrote down there, qualify out. So as you speak, 
it seems to me that you're actually trying to qualify them out as well as in. I get that. But actually, it's better to have clients that are going to do something with you than uh, on your CRM system rather than the ones that aren't. So is, is that something that you that you wanted to do no as question. well? Make this a qualification it, it, process? It's always about that, right? Um, yeah. But it feels different to the buyer because you're saying you're okay with the no and, and, and the power of no, you're, you're saying no to them also. If, if they don't acknowledge that they have these business issues that you uniquely solve, uh, I'll give you an example. When, when we were with Bon, we used to compete with the big guys, you know, over where you are, SAP is, is a household word. Um, it was over here as well and, and still is. And, and Oracle is a household name. Those logos are, are, are global and formidable. And, and we had to figure out who would buy from us because nobody had heard of us, right? And, yeah. and if they needed configure to order capability, which nobody had at that time, if, if, they were, if they were manufacturing something that was complex and hard to manufacture, but you could do it with permutations, features, and different options, um, think airplanes, uh, think, um, uh, think automobiles or think, uh, tractors, think anything that you manufacture where there's, there's different options that w- would create a different manufacturing process, different bill of material, perhaps different routing, different costing. We did that and we did it automatically in the software that, and today configurators are something that's out there, but in that time, nobody could touch this. And, and if they didn't have that requirement or didn't recognize the value of it, we were not going to win, Ian, because we were the no name. That, that piece that you mentioned earlier on about here is the value is very important in that place then. So is that like a, what, like an ROI calculator? Is it a case study? Is it a, here's what a similar client to you saved by doing this So we project? call it a value what, what story. What does that value look like? And, and, and the reason we call it a value story is that it's based off of the, the voice of the customer work, where the voice of the customer quotes and the value that, the economic value that was created for them is interlaced all throughout the process. And when you're done, you, you do create a, a, an economic ROI, but it's, it's, it's truly a business case because you're linking every one of your value claims back to a specific business problem that you are solving for them and, and, and that you're able to demonstrate how you solve it better than they do today and better than options that exist out there to help them solve it with something new that they might buy. So from a sales guy, that would be my nirvana. If, if, if one of my marketing team came to me and said, here is a fantastic value story, which will help you sell you in, I'd be over the moon with that. And I think that's what sales guys tend to struggle with is actually having the marketing materials to be able to do the, not convincing, but you know, to, to aid the sale. So how, how do you Go about doing that. How how does that value story really differ from question. something just like yeah? That's a great study, question. The, so so uh, we we do this, and we teach our, our partners to do this. Uh, we have we have partners that help us go to market because on the front end of doing this, you have to have intimate conversations with the customer's customer. So one of our customers would give us a list of anywhere from ten. Sometimes it's as, as low as five if they're a smaller company because this part is, is uh, expensive to do, but invaluable. But say five to 15 of their customers and, um, and, and specific to a vertical, if that makes sense, uh, for that business. And then you, you, we, you have to earn the right to actually have what we call a power level conversation, which means why did power is the person that could buy based on a business case. So even if they didn't have it in their budget, for example, they could move budget around to buy because they're the executive that has that level of authority. So what what we say is you, you have to connect at the power level within your customer base and have a conversation around what problems did you solve for them in from their perspective. And it's And it's very different. It's a very different conversation than what you would get uh, if you talked with the daily user of the solution, for example, if, if you talked with the daily user, you'd get features and function discussion, and um, uh, it would be m- linked closely with your product and, and, the, and the things that salespeople generally talk about when they engage, which is, you know, the product. 
versus if you talk to power, they'll tell you something very different. You know, we, we weren't, so uh, one of our customers um, ha- has a solution that analyzes all the video views out there in the world. There's 6 billion videos out there in the world. <laughs> and they, there's, there's this marketplace called the Digital First Marketplace who are creating videos that compete with the big guys. So think of... Uh, uh, Universal here, Universal Network, Disney, you know, it's a name the world knows, right? So those guys have been creating yep. videos and movies for, for decades. And these upstarts called Digital First are, are starting to crush them because they know what the, 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 the zero to 29 year olds want to watch. Now, how do you compete with that? Well, an executive that would buy from our from from this customer I'm talking about has the data that would inform their team how do they compete how do they come back from that so that's why would that person buy that you know the 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 answer you're going to get is is very closely tied to the business it's it's value based it's about um, things like um, well, how's it growing top line revenue? How's it impacting our market capitalization? How, how much more efficient are my analysts, my digital analysts, such that I wouldn't have to hire more as we grew, for example? Those, those are economic things that are framed in different words than you would get if you talk to the digital analyst, for example, that's using that product on a daily basis. Something you mentioned earlier, and I wrote down, I just want to try and pull you back to that, was was materials. Do you have set materials along this journey that sales guys we do. would need we do. to convert? And, and we, change, we change their thinking. We change companies' thinking on what they lead with. So we actually create a f- initial presentation that sellers use. And, and unlike conventional presentations, which often start with, here's my company, you know, look at this picture. Isn't this great? You know, here's my product. Yeah. Here's what it does. We don't we don't start with any of that. What we start with is I did my homework. Yeah. I think you have the problem I solve. Here it is. Here it is in your words or one of your people's words. Here's where I've solved this before. Here here's you know this these are the people in your position have bought and here's why, and here's a here's the value we created and here's a prediction of value for you. Now, I, I don't mean to be, to be offensive. You know, I, I don't mean to imply that this is right necessarily, but it's pretty close because it's based on good data. And if you let me go to the next step with the people you trust, which, which power is generally not going to give you two, a very long meeting. It could be 15 minutes. It could be an hour, but they're then going to direct you to the people that, that are equipped to analyze your solution at a deep level, which is where most sellers work to begin with. But the difference now is that you've been sponsored and the goal is to verify a business case and and collaboratively produce a business case and then come back to that same person and say, I was able to prove it or I wasn't, you know, that, you know, you're not, we're not ready for each other. Or it all, the other thing it allows you to do is, is you need certain level of talent within the company and they either have it or you've got to train it up or you've got to you've got to supplement it so that they have the right talent they need to get the the business benefit that everybody wants. So you also produce a much more effective complete solution proposal that allows you to go back and and look that that decision maker in the eye and say I can I can meet this business case we created but only if you also purchase these things which close the gap that exists in your organization which would keep you from being successful. I totally agree. And and I was just talking to a client last week about this, you know, prospects do not care that you were founded in 1993, that you've (laughs) got this award, your ISO 9001 accredited. They don't care. It's sad to say, but they don't. You put all this effort into to kind of get get all this work and they're not bothered. It's, you know, it's the the benefit for that client. And so I love that. I love how you've started with that. So, You've started that presentation. Is there anything else? And I'm really interested in this from my point of view, along those milestones that a sales guy needs in his kit bag. You know, is it is it that, um, what do you call it, the value story? So you've got a great presentation. You've got a value story. What else is in there? 
So the value story lives also inside the software and it allows you to create a unique experience that's guided. So you, you know which things, which business issues they have, so you know which value you create. So you then lay that out for them and you give them a range of value that you've created for others and you link that back to the business the to the case studies that you've done through the voice of the customer work and and therefore it's it's sort of irrefutable um, they may not believe they can do it but it's been done and here's my proof and then what you do is is this is your sales time but it's again linked to those specific things of value where if you now demonstrate a product or if you bring a manufacturing sample or whatever your solution is, you now link it to that value as opposed to just, you know, look at this great engineered order capability we have, or like you said, here's the quality standards, the exacting ISO quality standards. It's it's about that, but it isn't about that. It, it, it's about producing a business result. And when you want, when you walk them through that process, you collaboratively then produce, we, we produce a graphic, which we call the value waterfall, which shows the value in pillars, but it's not yours anymore. When you're done, it's, it's theirs. It's collaboratively produced. They know what you do. You demonstrate your solution and show them how you uniquely solve that. And then the system creates a final presentation for you based on those results and it, it gets you about 80% of the way there. You then tailor it from there. But it all, it all stores and saves in the software. So everything is there. It's half or 80% produced for you. And I don't mean to oversell this, but, but what sellers want is they want something that actually does help them sell with the flexibility to make it completely on target for that client. So when you ask for the business, the chronicalization of that deal is all inside the software. The dollar amounts, the dates, the presentations, the research. So even when you're done and you've closed it, now your your organization is in a unique position to fulfill on those promises that you made and that they're going to make to their own organization about what they're going to accomplish with you. Jeff, you don't have to worry about selling it because actually I don't think you've sold it enough because we were talking about the sales process and just about, you know, general kind of closing deals. And and then you kind of slip in and the system does this. So basically, if, if I can try and make you sell it here, you're, you're saying that the, this system will run alongside this whole process, capture everything, meetings, um, and it'll compile and try to get you 80% through the through the buying process with, with, with and having some sort of collateral at the end of it. That's that's exactly right, and and then if they have Salesforce today, and which which much of the world does, or another CRM, it it doesn't matter if 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 they're using uh, Netscape or if they're using Dynamics. We then we we actually dynamically pass the information from our system to that system all the time and keep them in sync. So if if they have a prescribed way of forecasting. We actually put the things in there that we know they need now, which one of them is a zebra score and and some of the other key components. Um, So management has what they need um, to continue to run the business, but now with with some things that that uniquely put them in a position so that they know that their forecast is is actually accurate. In fact, um, as you know from the cover of our book, we say that it's possible to close 90% of the business you pursue. And, and we've been doing this now for 18 years and, and we have, we have, we, we've done hundreds of customers and thousands of sellers. And, and when they do this right over a period of time, that's the level of accuracy that they get to. 18 years, you've been involved in sales and sales process. And now you become a technology company. Am I right? We're talking about software here. We're talking about systems. You're talking about integrating with people's CRM. Have you pivoted, pivoted this business into a software company then is that what you are big time wow. <laughs> and it was painful <laughs> we, we we used to do all of this with excel spreadsheets and yeah 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 and they were they were they were great excel spreadsheets <laughs> but they were they were complex and uh, and it would produce uh powerpoint presentations and things and and uh you know but but it was it was very expensive to create and um 
And so we could, and, and it was time consuming. So we could only help a limited number of companies per year. So for the last four or five years, we, we actually tried to create software. And, and the first time we failed, um, we, uh, we actually lost both customers that we, that we tried to implement it, which is, uh, that's a painful story. Um, but this, this next version, um, is, it's so much simpler um, than what we did before, and now we've we've uh, shifted our model where um, we're training partners in various parts of the world on how to do what we do and do it through the software, so that we can reach more people. I mean, we we literally want to change the way the world sells. That that's our vision. Um, it might be take longer than I'll be alive, you know, but, <laughs> <laughs> but that's our vision. <laughs> I love that. I love that vision. And I agree. I mean, you've heard me use the term sales professional throughout this interview. And it's something that I use quite often because unfortunately we've been tainted with the snake oil 1950 salesman yes. techniques. And it's not like that at all. And it's actually a very strategic, difficult, enjoyable uh, career. But it, it it isn't like those snake oil days. So I love that vision. And, and what you're trying to say is that actually, yes, you may want to have a great sales process, but the buying experience is really key to all this as well. The, the client has to enjoy it and feel they've benefited from that experience. They, they do. And, and if your goal, our goal is to create a, a business partnership with with a client for 10 years we we want to view it that we're going to be together for 10 years and and when you take that long-term view you approach them differently on every every interaction that you have with them you you do it in a collaborative way you you make sure you you uh, you propose it right you make sure that that not only that you have everything you know they need to be successful but that you don't let them buy it wrong and then after they buy you don't let them implement it wrong either. Wouldn't wouldn't it be brilliant if you could just tell the client that everything was going to be okay and to trust you? You know, sometimes they've got the, the kind of the back up, the backs up, and they're very nervous about things, and the shutters are down, and they kind of won't let you in. Um, I would just wish sometimes we could get them across, but I guess the way you get them across is to demonstrate these these value stories and things like that and just give them the peace of mind that it's going to be okay. You know, the way that you sell becomes part of your differentiation is is, is what we say. It, it, if you sell this way, it almost doesn't matter what your competition does because they can't match it. I wish I wish you could look at my pad in front of me because I've got differentiators. I've got value waterfall. I've got customers, customers. And this is what you're doing. The way the way this is structured to sell, it's doing something different different than your um, competitors. Are. It, it it really is, and and you know when we just to give you an idea of of uh, what it takes to figure it out, um, when when we sign up a partner, we do the first implementation, and they they participate um, as deeply as possible, but they ha- they won't understand all the nuances of what makes this work or. Or, or what the sellers, what problems the sellers will, will run up against first. And, you know, we, I've been doing it for so long, you know, we know. And the yeah. second one, it's kind of like ERP. Um, you'd never take a new implementer and put them on a project and have them lead, right? The yeah. second one, the partner leads, but we're there to ensure success. So, we, you know, we, we, you know, it starts with that voice of the customer work, which is the hardest thing for us to train on. And and we've had um, we've had investors who were worried that we couldn't teach others how to do that because it's, you know, it's it's the key. It, um, getting those nuggets from existing customers who sometimes don't even know the value that you created for them. So so you literally are yeah. pulling it out of them as well. And then writing those stories up, which are, they're, they're not like the normal case studies, Ian, you know, it's not a single page or two page, you know, bulleted. Yeah. It's purposely six to eight to 10 pages with multiple stories that sellers can learn and, 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 and educate from. So it's, yeah. you know, with, even with the partners and then the third one, 
the partner leads completely and we're just there for support. And then they're off and running. But it literally takes three implementations before they can do this successfully with, with our clients, our mutual clients. And, and we're there because we're passionate about the success. So thinking about this, is this designed to sell six-figure sales then? You know, obviously, if I was going to sell you something for a couple of, couple of grand, a couple of thousand dollars, you don't really want to be looking through eight to 10 pages of, of value stories and that kind of thing. So is this you know, really kind of focusing on, the, on those larger sales? So, it's, so if, you were, if you were just going to create the materials um, and you did a bunch of voice of the customer, yes, it's six figures. But if you, if you did it and you started small and you did three to five and you did it over a period of time, we recommend that companies do this for three years. Because there's there's a change management initiative that 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 uh, goes okay. along with this. So it's and scalable. It, exactly, it has to be scalable, and it has to be affordable. So you can do this for a lot less than you'd think, but but you have to commit to it over time. And then there's a monthly. You pay the monthly, and and then you get the the benefit that's more in line with with the payment. So as the benefit happens, you're paying, and. Uh, so we've made it affordable, and the, and the software is inexpensive. I mean, it's you know, it's it's very inexpensive. Although I'm, I guess I'm, that's I'm, always relative, right? But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, forever the sales guy there. So um, I, generally, as I could talk to you all day about sales, is my passion. But I, I'm mindful of the time, and I just want to try and drill into a couple of things. We're we'll talking about you now being a software business, and that comes with challenges. And I just want to tease a little bit out of you of some of the challenges that you've faced over this last couple of years. You mentioned some of it was painful. Um, would you mind just elaborating on, on your journey since you've, you've, you've kind of delved into the software world? Absolutely. So there's, so every, you know, everything I've ever read and even personally experienced says don't have two business models because um, you'll fail. And, and a services business model where you're doing all the work and a, and a business model where you don't do that services, you just do software. Those, those are two very different business models. And um, so we've, we've sort of been straddling that fence where we've had to do both as, as we brought the new software to market so that we could keep the lights on. Um, you know, we, we were limited in growth with our old, our old way of doing things because we could only do so many customers per year based on you know, the, the, the services intensive um, path that I, that you and I have been talking about. And so as we transition and, and we train our partners, uh, we had to figure out how do we maintain sales levels enough to, to pay the bills as, as we move to this model where most of the services are done through our partners and the success happens through our partners. So that, that was the first one. Um, the, 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 a second one is that um, software um, we develop here and in Sri Lanka. So we, we have our designers here. Um, we have um, our people who, to, who do the testing. We have some automation and testing, but, but we have a team in Sri Lanka and, and, uh, and, and that's, um, that's challenging. Um, it's, it's, it's rewarding. Um, and there's unique problems there too. Um, I, I, I won't go into the details of those in, unless you have an interest, but that, that was, that was another thing that we had to work our way through and, and, uh, and, and figure out. And we're in the cloud, by the way. So we use Amazon's web services and, and it, so it's on anywhere, anytime, anywhere in the world. And, um, so you've got to support, you know, every mobile device known to man, um, yeah. Right. Yeah. And and you have to support sellers, young sellers, for example, um, and who want yes. to learn via podcasts, for example. Right. I mean, yeah, that's the way they choose to learn. And through short videos, you know, they, they don't want a video that's I mean, three to seven minute video to teach you something is about about all they'll tolerate. So so that's the way you have to do it. <laughs> tolerate. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> Well, you know, it is. I, I could, I could really drill in a lot further on, on some of those challenges because we have a lot of tech businesses on the show, and obviously my background's in software, and I do know the some of the challenges faced. So, so best of luck for it. And uh, this has been a success meeting, Jeff. I really enjoyed it. Our time, 
And uh, I can't believe it's actually been 40 minutes. So uh, thank you very much. Maybe I'll have to have you back on. It's, it's, uh, it's very interesting. So best of luck. Thank you. And uh, where, uh, why not leave uh, our listeners with where they can find you and, and maybe how you could help them? So go to sellingtozebras.com. And you'll 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 see who we are, or they can reach out to me on LinkedIn at Jeff Kozer, K O S E R, um, with Selling to Zebras. We have Selling to Zebras out there on LinkedIn also, so we're pretty easy to find. Or or go to Amazon. Selling to Zebras is our book. Um, it's uh, they can download it on Kindle for I don't know what it is, five bucks or something. You know, it's inexpensive. Excellent. Thanks very much, Jeff. So sell well, my friend, and we'll speak to you soon. Thanks, Ian. Thanks to Jeff Koza. Now, if that floated your boat, if selling's your thing, we've got a copy of Selling to Zebras for one lucky listener to win. Check out the pinned post on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. You can navigate through industryangel.com to those platforms. You'll, you'll find it. So get on there and you could be a lucky winner. It's a great book. I've got a copy here sat on my desk so get in there you never know if you've left me an apple podcast review please let me know so i can thank you on an upcoming show as you know i see every one of your amazing messages i love to receive them through twitter and on email so keep in touch okay so i'm off now to my daughter's christmas show which should be a hoot so until next time I'm Ian Farrer, this is the Industry Angel, and thanks for listening.